Uh, today we do have Wolfgang Bauer and Tavis Allison from the Mule Bites. And they will be talking about the patronage system of RPG production. And Tavis, I will move to you. Uh, how are you doing, Wolfgang? I'm doing great. You look very uh, impressionistic. <laughs> yeah, this is the CC without a camera. <laughs> so uh, you and I were on a panel before about uh, Kickstarters, and so I know a little bit about uh, uh, the the patronage system. I was also a patron of yours on uh, River King. Oh, yeah, uh, oh, but yeah. assuming that we have audience members who are not so well informed, uh, why don't you start it by telling us what uh, the patronage model is? Sure, sure. It's a little a bit little like bit kick, kick, Kickstarter. Kickstarter. Oh man, I'm getting the echo on my audio channel. It's very distracting. It's not. Uh, I don't hear it, but if you put headphones in, sometimes that helps. Oh, I think I have headphones. headphones. And the Hold on. Let me try this. Hey. hey. No, still no, the echo. echo. I think my headphones are not working, so it could be through my channel. I'm going to mute myself and see if that helps. Uh, so oh, I'll try it now. Hey, what do you know? It was coming through your channel. Oh, all right, well, we may need to hit the mute button on you occasionally, or it's going to get weird. Uh, but I'm going to talk about the patronage system for a couple minutes and then pitch it back to you. Uh, the system is sort of what, sort of like Kickstarter uh, before there was Kickstarter. The idea being a bunch of people get together, want to collaborate on a design, uh, want to pay a particular designer uh, to do some work, and they throw money in a hat. And when there's enough funding, uh, they run ahead with it. Uh, Greg Stolze also calls this the ransom model. He'll he'll do all the work himself, uh, and then he'll just pass the hat until a certain amount is reached. And if that that number is hit, then he says, "Okay, here's here's the project. I'm releasing it to the public." Um, and in his ransom model of of patronage, they're very related. Um, basically, he releases it, and and that's it. Right? It's done. It's out to the public. Um, my patronage system usually results in uh, a product that is uh, both print and PDF and has a lot of collaboration. The people who pitch money in the hat also have uh, the option to brainstorm it, to provide feedback, to play test it, and as a result uh, it's it's a extremely bulletproof, well-tested, uh, reviewed document that uh, is the result of a lot of clever minds instead of just you know one designer. Um, over time this model has become more difficult as the number of people interested in it have grown but it's also been very successful in cultivating new designers. A number of people who have had success as patrons they have also uh, gone on to careers uh, either as freelancers or in paid staff positions in the RPG field. So it's a really it, it's a unique first rung in RPGs um, just like blogging on a site can be a first rung or publishing with a periodical um, you know throwing 50 bucks into a patronage project and and sort of seeing behind the scenes can likewise make a big difference for somebody who's just starting out. So that's the overview. Uh, the details get, you know, into the weeds fairly quickly. So why don't you tell me? Uh, don't you tell me about your experience with River King or or with your own leading your own projects? Uh, I'm definitely in the category of people for whom I guess I'd been a, a freelancer before participating in River King, uh, but you know, doing. Um, Writing freelance, you don't get the same degree of feedback from the people that you're writing for. Hi, David. Uh, we are uh, we're asking Wolfgang Gang Bauer. He's just described the patronage model for us, and we are discussing um, the the nuts and bolts of uh, making the transition from being a patron contributing to a project under under its leader to uh, doing independent design. 
So you, in the old days, you hear about people who would work with like the famous science fiction editors and they would turn in their first story and it would be rejected, but you got this really detailed feedback. Yeah. And those were the days. Yeah. I, I, as far as I can tell, they're mythical, you know? Yeah. There's one or, I think there were one or two science fiction markets that were known for feedback. They were also known for having a turnaround time, generally upwards of 200 days. Mm -hmm. So you would submit a story and you'd say, well, maybe next year I will get feedback. Um, so that's the downside of, of that sort of submissions process, right? If, you, if the editors are actually providing any feedback, it takes forever, six months, a year, not uncommon. How do you manage that with the patronage projects? Because you do provide the, the sort of in, you know, very intimate feedback and very, uh, very close collaboration. How do you manage to also be roughly on schedule? Well, sometimes we're not. <laughs> uh, a lot of these projects have gone over the uh, intended word count, so people get more than their money's worth. I mean, they're signing up for a book of 96 pages, and they wind up with 160 pages of stuff. And every time it gets longer, of course, that's more time spent in design, more time in playtest, more time in edit, more time in layout, and it, it just sort of can easily snowball into months of delay. But for the most part, because people know that there's still progress and they can go on the forums and see, hey, here's where it is, um, people have been remarkably tolerant of those delays. Um, I have always tried to ship on time and estimate correctly, but collaboration and sort of group design just takes longer than you think. Uh, the feedback portion, I mean, part of it's out on forums, so anybody can chime in and the brainstorms are wide open. Um, and part of it, I limit the feedback financially, frankly. On, on recent projects, I've said, if you want to pitch an adventure into a book that's 12 adventures and you want feedback from, you know, three lead designers or two designers and an editor, uh, then you pitch in more money to the project, right? It's like, okay, you're in for 250 bucks and you get feedback um, because it's impossible for me to provide feedback to 400 people. Um, How many people actually, like what's the ratio of people who are, uh, who are watching the process to people who are contributing some to people who are really, you know, doing new things every day? Sure. I think it's... Something like 75% of the people don't don't contribute, right? They're lurking on the mm -hmm. forums or they don't even show up and, like, read it. They're really in it because it's like, eh, I'm putting in sort of a minimal amount of money and I'm going to get a really cool book at the end and I don't care how you make it, right? So they're treating it like a pre-order. Um and that's fine. I, I think if, if all 400 people were on the forums commenting, it, it might get out of hand. Um, you know, 100 people are engaged to some degree, about a quarter uh, of, of the recent number of patrons, about 400. And the 100 people is still manageable. I can remember names and, and follow a thread. Uh, the people who are really most engaged are probably 30 people about 10% or less. Uh, and that's fine. Having a, I mean, think about a, a business meeting with 30 people in it or, you know, a committee, uh, a convention, uh, uh, organizing team. Just getting 30 people to pull in the same direction uh, is a challenge. How do you avoid... Uh like what what does it take to get people moving in that direction and how do you avoid a kind of design by committee thing yeah that was a problem we had to face up against early and and we have several solutions um one thing is when you're sort of working collaboratively with other people we've always said there's a lead designer they're the benign dictator what they say goes uh, this works fairly well. It works even better when certain topics are put to a vote, right? If we say we have 20 ideas uh, to pursue in this design space, we're only going to be able to pursue three of them. You know, everybody vote. 
and it's been remarkable. The people who lurk come out of the woodwork, right? Suddenly we'll get 130 or 150 votes um, when it's clear that only 30 people have been chatting on the boards. Um, so it becomes a bit of a meritocracy. Sometimes people vote for something weird. Uh, there are things that skew a little strange to my tastes, but everyone seems satisfied. It's like, oh, those are the three best, or yeah, those are the top three. I like number four too. Uh, and then we'll, you know, lock it down. Those three ideas will proceed. So that's one way is, is we do use a little democracy. Um, the other thing is it all goes through the lead developer or the lead designer and a developer and an editor. All of those people are pulling in a particular direction. So when we have different voices and different tech styles, it tends to get smoothed out a little. Um, the design by committee happens a lot less than you think because everyone is basically given a chapter, a monster, a chunk, and that monster or chapter doesn't get written by many people. It gets written by one person. Um, so the work itself is spread over many people. They're all working in parallel, um, but they're each responsible for their piece, and no one else gets to tell them how to write that piece. That's how we solve it. And so people are contributing parts to this overall vision, but you're you're maintaining the overall vision in part by framing the conversation. Oh yeah, there's always a theme. There's always a topic, right? Um, I mean, in River King, it was, hey, there's this uh, elvish realm, and it's going to be sylvan and fey and high magic, and you know maybe we're going to get some whimsical animals in here. Um, that's all fine. In another project, it was, well, we're going to do sort of a Mines of Moria gold rush kind of thing. And everyone said, oh, Dwarven Halls. All right. We, we know what's in the universe of possibility for Dwarven Halls. And where it gets really interesting in those things and where it gets – where the creative collaboration really shows its power is when somebody says uh, – drops an idea into the mix that crystallizes a whole lot of other lines of thought, and it seems to come out of left field. So in Halls of the Mountain King, that was Brandon Hodge said, what if there was a secret brotherhood, a society, a Freemason dwarves? And everybody said, ooh, Freemason, yeah, and dwarves, those two things go together. And this secret society lets us do X and Y and Z. And all of a sudden, that idea that you know, it's not really part of the Gold Rush idea or the Mines of Moria kind of idea. Um, give us a new slant on everything. And and those crystallizing ideas seem to show up every project. There's always some twist that everybody latches onto and says, okay, that's what's going to make this project stand out. So uh, David has a question from the chat. He's asking uh, what you would say are the best and worst results of the uh, patronage process so far. Huh. Wow. I don't know. Uh, it's, <laughs> a, it's very much a matter of taste, but... Hmm. Wow. The, the thing that I see as uh, among the best results are I think that the, you you mentioned already that there's a bridge from from amateur to pro, yeah. And so, f in terms of the participation, I think that you know there's there's a shrinking space for opportunities to see what it's like to work in the business. Yes. And and so being a patron and, and getting that feedback, I think, is a fantastic result. It's not just the feedback. In a lot of cases, people show up and they're like, "Well, what's a pitch? And how do I structure this? Right? And how mm -hmm. do I outline and and what do I do? What do I need to have in the play test draft? And, and you know, do I need to account for maps? And how do I do that? And how do I write an art brief? I've never done an art brief. I have no idea there's such a thing as an art brief. And and so these components that are pretty standard for anyone working in publishing, you know, there's no reason that you would know this stuff um, coming in cold. So you you not just get feedback on the quality of your design work. Uh, through playtest and your peers, 
you also get, uh, I don't know, Boot Camp 101 on, yeah. you know, <laughs> what are the tools I need? Yeah, you get to try out all the levers in the sausage factory. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that is probably the best result, is a number of people have gotten to see the Sausage Factory, got to play around in it. Some of them have gone on to professional careers. Others have said, that's very cool. I'm going to let you guys do that. <laughs> I'm going to stay over here and play, right? Because they said, eh, that's work. Or, eh, I like it, but not enough to, like, commit that kind of time. Um the worst stuff that comes out of it is, of course, you get creative friction and creative differences, and occasionally somebody blows up and wants to take their ball and go home. Um, it's inevitable, right? Somebody says, that name is stupid, or I don't like your map, or, you know, and, and doesn't really back up their opinion, or, or it's just so subjective you can't, <laughs> you can't talk them out of their opinion, right? It's their opinion. Um, and so that's why we do say the lead designer's word goes. Uh, if you don't like it, well, there are 500 other decisions we'll make before this thing ships. So, you know, you're going to lose some. But as a whole, I think uh, the people who are less likely to work well in this kind of collaborative environment, they can go on and do perfectly good work. It's just they say, ah, eh, this teamwork part of it is irritating. I want to do it mm -hmm. on my own. And and they don't get the benefit of the feedback and those other things. But, you know, I started as a solo freelance. I didn't have any of this sort of collaboration or peers to work with. And there are plenty of really talented designers today who still, they've got their keyboard, they've got their deadline, they've got an outline. Um, you know, they don't bounce it off. 10 other people before going ahead with it. They just do it. Mm -hmm. That's a totally valid approach. I think another thing that, that makes patronage, it's one of the best results of patronage, is that it's exposed to so many people in the in the development process. Yep. That you, as a backer, you can be like, this thing really addresses what I need at the gaming table. Yes. And it doesn't... It, it doesn't have to be a mass market thing. It, it's not, oh, a million people need this at the gaming table. It's me and a hundred other people really have a need for this one thing. Yeah. We can do more niche products. Um, we can do more uh, tools that are useful at the table. We tend to do more handouts, more playable maps. We've done a lot with, like, battle maps that are printed at scale. So your one-inch squares come out one-inch squares. When you print it out, just put it on the table, you're done. Um We've done a number of things where it's been like, well, these are the elements I need, and here's the spicy, interesting garnish on it. Um, we get a better balance, I think, than we get in some professional products where the people inside the company say, we want to do this thing, and the freelancer says, I want to do this thing. And, you know, maybe 25% of that product is... Uh, less useful than it could be. Yeah. It, it has to go through the crucible of, I mean, we play test everything. <laughs> and uh, so stuff comes through and it's like you're missing X, Y, and Z or these numbers are impossible to hit with the characters that were provided. Um, it makes a big difference. And I think this is why patronage projects keep winning stuff like Ennies. Um I mean, Streets of Zobek won the Gold Any for Best Adventure this last year. Um, it's not anybody's idea of a massively commercial thing. It's a mean streets, Chinatown fantasy kind of thing, right? Um, mm -hmm. But It's an urban fantasy like Fawford and the Grey Mouser. But, you know, there's whorehouses and there's mm. <laughs> really <laughs> smuggling and, and nasty deeds. It's definitely in the uh, somewhat more mature subject matter, but it's really well done. Um, and I don't know if a house like Paizo, well, Paizo might, they might go a little dark, but, you know, we didn't have to worry about, is this going to upset somebody? Uh, we said this suits the needs of our playgroups. Mm -hmm. You were saying that people can do it and you can get by just fine with a keyboard and a knowledge of when your deadlines are. But to make something that way that's well playtested, you have to go above and beyond. Oh, yeah. Where, 
with patron, it seems like that play testing and that being sure it responds to people's needs falls out of the process almost as a byproduct. Yeah. I mean, people will call you on your, on your BS in patronage, um, and they're polite about it and they're constructive about it, but they'll say you're spending 3000 words on something that, you know, doesn't come up. Um, or they won't, they won't say it right. The editor or the play tester will say it later. It's like, we're over word count. These 3,000 words don't seem to matter to anybody. It get cut, gets cut out of the book. We always overwrite. And then stuff that's less important tends to trickle into, like, blog posts or a supplementary PDF or, you know, somewhere else. Um, but it's not the main the main product anymore. Um, there's, there's nothing like you know, your peers who've all chipped in money and are invested saying, hey, I really want this to succeed, and here's why I think we need to change something. You don't get a lot of griefing, right? There's not people who haven't chipped in um, just kind of trolling these boards. Everyone who's on it wants it to work, and I think that's part of the secret of success. Yeah, I certainly see that the community that forms around a Kickstarter is, is very positive. Yeah. Because it's defined by people who've put some skin into the game. Yeah. I mean, the people who want to mock it can mock it from miles away, but they're never going to put, you know, 50 bucks into a Kickstarter just to mock it. <laughs> it's ridiculous, <laughs> right? They're not going to show up. Um, so, yeah, you get a self-selected community of people who want it to work. I see that uh, David is typing a new question for us. Uh -huh. So. He He's asking, I already have a ton of books. Why would I want to get into a patronage project? Sure. That's a great question. Um, I think in a lot of cases, people who are into patronage are either looking um, to influence the design of a book to suit their tastes, and we've had that happen. Playtesters especially are really well-placed um, to influence the, the design, the final design uh, in adventures. Um, the other reason might be, yeah, you see behind the curtain, you improve your own chops, and you, you see how much freelancing you want to do, right? Um, it's certainly possible to wait until a patronage project is complete and has gone out to the world and has won the gold any for 2012 as best adventure and then say, yeah, okay, that book is worth my time. I will buy a copy and it will go, you know, I'll read it and play it. Um, you don't have to buy into the whole patronage part of the process. You can just purchase the result afterwards. Um, I think the other reason to get involved is you tend to meet a lot of cool people. <laughs> uh, the patronage project we did for, it was called Six Arabian Nights. It was like the second, yeah, the second project we ever did. Um, one of the people who signed up lives in Kuwait. And so whenever we had questions about Arab culture or the Middle East, um, or could you just get us some cool reference pictures of a camel? Uh, yeah, he was there. He was like, well, you know, we don't actually travel around on camels, but I know a guy. Uh, <laughs> so you think you have a super brain working on this, I guess, a, a super brain working on a patronage project versus regular brain on other projects than... I didn't catch all of that, but yeah. So you said you have a super brain. You have a, a, a whole group of people with expertise, so as opposed to just one guy who has to try to figure everything out. Like if I was to write yes. an Arabian adventure, it'd be based on just what I know about Arabia. Absolutely, and the oh man, the other great example I can point to with the hive mind super brain um, was the book called Northlands, which is all about Arctic and Norse culture. And a ton of people signed up who are Norwegian, Swedes, a Dane, I think one Icelander. Anyway, they all grew up in the Nordic countries, and they told us, you know, we were forced to read the sagas in high school. Um, so this mythology is, is was like, we know it really well. And what we want is we want the fantasy D&D &D version of this stuff. And they were an incredible resource because they could point us to, uh, like, original text when we cared, and they could point us to the parts that are like, well, we're gamers, and we think this is the part that would turn into a really cool fantasy monster. But nobody who doesn't speak Swedish or Old Norse 
is ever going to know about that stuff. So yeah, they were an incredible resource. Um, and it's been that way on almost every project. I mean, if you care about the deep dark forest with the Brothers Grimm, then Tales of the Old Margrave attracted like-minded people. And that hive mind was awesome. So in the chat, uh, David is asking, how much typically do people in the uh, patronage project add ideas that might not otherwise be incorporated? Yeah, it's a ton. Um, there's always an outline and a theme to begin with, like, you know, Arabian Nights or Norse stuff. Um, but then the question becomes, yeah, what specifically gets added? And the first stage in the way that Cobalt Press does patronage is a series of brainstorms. And some of these will go on for a week and hundreds of ideas. Um, and the ones that people respond to and say, yeah, that's cool, and wouldn't it be even cooler if, and wouldn't it be even cool, and they start to attract a fan base, if you like, right? There are people on the forums who are like, that's a cool idea, and I want to play with it some more. Those things all wind up in the outline. Other things, like, all right, we need a section on magic items. You know, people will propose 50 items. We've only got room for 20. We'll do a vote. But all of that stuff, the, the seed, the idea, comes from the brainstorm. And someone else may wind up writing it than the person who proposed it. But there's huge influence in that early stage of what actually goes into the book. Um, and then the other stage that's hugely influential is the playtest stage where we break stuff. Um, that's less about what's in or out, but you'd be surprised. Stuff gets added pretty late. Like, you know, you talk about this or you talk about that and it's never in the manuscript, put it in the manuscript. Uh, if a playtester comes back and says you're missing something cool, it will often get reworked by the, the adventure author to incorporate that new coolness. So, yeah, I mean, the lead designer probably writes 25% to 50% of the book, and the rest of it is written by patrons or is, you know, written based on some of their ideas. Um, I think this is part of why people get so invested in it, right? It's like, well, the cool thing I wanted got into the book. Are there kinds of projects for which the patronage model wouldn't be appropriate? Yeah, I think there are. Um, a lot of what's been most successful for us has been adventures, which break down into neat little uh, subsets of buy and counter. Uh, source books, which break down into neat little subsets of here's a monster, here's an item, here's an NPC, um, where we have had, I don't know, less success. Um, well, I don't think we could pull off a set of core rules that would make everybody happy, for instance, right? So the Cobalt Press model has been we're going to take an existing set of rules, whether that's D&D, &D, Pathfinder, Dragon Age, whatever, Call of Cthulhu we've even done once, uh, and we're going to build on that existing rule set. Um, but that's our foundation. I think building a foundation collaboratively could be done, but it's a lot harder. I, I think those sorts of core rules are best hammered out by a group of one, two, three people. Um, by the time you've got 30 people chipping in, it does turn into design by committee because all the parts are linked much more tightly to each other um, than, you know, the separate spells in a book of spells are. Those stand pretty much independent. Um, the other sorts of project that might not work for patronage, uh, you know, really short and sweet stuff. It tends to work better at, at longer lengths, bigger word counts. Um, but yeah, we've we've had success with the ones we've done. So for adventures and source books, no problem. With Adventure Conquer King, we got a lot of uh, sort of crowdsourced input on core rules. 
But I don't think that's an exception because we were working from the chassis of the sort of basic expert D and D rules. Mm -hmm. And we, we had a genre, you know, we were in the same way that saying this is Arabian nights will guide people's intuitions saying this is an old school product. We were already on the same page. Yeah. I think, I think if it was like these core rules express a unique vision that we have to argue about what that vision is, there's not already a consensus built. I can see how that'd be tough. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think I see another question from David here. Yeah. So that's, he's talking about, uh, he says, have we tried applying this model to the large uh, setting, like a galactic federation, a ring world or a Dyson sphere? Yeah. Well, uh, not yet to those three examples, but I think it would, it might work. I mean, the nice thing about a galactic federation or a ring world is you can slice it and dice it into cultures or climates. Um, yeah, it might work. Uh, certainly the Midgard campaign setting is the result of a lot of collaboration and was done as a patronage project. Uh, it's dark fantasy, so it has that unifying theme, and a lot of it was written over the last five years. Uh, in other patron projects, so big chunks of it were already d- defined at the start. Um, I think going in with that vision is the key thing, that, that you're absolutely right about that. Um, if you have a vision for this galactic federation as, I don't know, uh, on the upswing, but recently you know, some new alien contact has thrown things into chaos, if you can you can give this elevator pitch. What is this setting about? Um, and everyone knows that when they're signing up, buys into it, then you're then you're set. You could use it by all means. Now, when you talk about the elevator pitch, are you just talking about like, like anything like um, I don't know? You had an idea that was like, inspired by an existing uh, by existing setting. Could you just use that for your elevator's pitch, or do you need something like? Okay, we've got a rebuilding a <coughs> rebuilding a galactic society after a major war, and uh, you know something like that. Maybe, like you know, like sometimes some things I I got I had an idea for you know I mean, you you see something you like you want to you want to be inspired by it but you don't want to copy it. You know? Well, I think there's a lot of this is going to be like this other thing during those early stages, right? And this is why Hollywood pitches often sound like, um, you know, it's Jaws in space or, or something along those lines because until you've made the new thing, nobody knows how cool it is. So the, the best you can say is, you know, it's a trap-filled old-school dungeon. It's like Tomb of Horrors meets... Uh, you know, steading of the hill giants. I, so, I would lean on those comparisons at least to get people who are sympathetic to your vision, right? Um, it's like Games Workshop but, uh, meets Traveler. I don't know. Some of those cases, it's not going to work, right? Um, the clearer your vision is and the more you can say, this is where we're headed at the start, the more likely you are to attract people who are sympathetic to it. The, the worst thing that can happen is somebody shows up and says, oh my god, this is just like Traveler. I hate Traveler. You know, I'm out. You suck. Give me a refund. Um, so be clear about what that vision is that you're pursuing. Is offering refunds an important part of your strategy? I offer them, I have had like three people ever take me up on it. Um, Mostly people show up and they say, this is great, because they do do get a a sense of what they're buying into. Um, Often they quickly realize, oh my god, they promised me a 100-page book and I'm going to get a 200-page book out of this, plus some extra maps. And they're like, okay, well, I'm not totally on board with the concept, but I'm getting so much stuff. Um, so, yeah, I don't think I've given a lot of refunds over time. There have been a couple, and I'm, I'm happy to see those people go. I really am. It's like, you're not happy here. We're not happy to have you. You're just going to complain and, and sort of, you know, grouse all over the boards about how it's not what you thought it was. 
Well, don't stick around for something you don't enjoy. We don't like having you. <laughs> Raining on our parade. We all love Arabian Nights and you don't. What did you think you were signing up for, right? Um, so yeah, I, I give them their money cheerfully and say, yeah, maybe the next project will be more to your taste. But on the other hand, you have, have people who like might maybe try to correct what they see as flaws. Like suppose they have an idea for a setting inspired by Legion of Superheroes, but somebody say, well, it's not really really realistic. You have these teenagers out, you know, spending the galaxy fighting these major villains. You know, but made it make more sense to have like a police academy. You know, so that, in other words, you're, they're, they're like they accept. You know, they, they still kind of like you know. The idea, but it's just a, it's just part of the idea. The reason why they want to build something new is there's something about the original that you know bothered them, or they just didn't like, or struck them the wrong way. They're trying to like be constructive and say, okay, we're going to make this a police academy. These are you know um, adults, and you know they signed up for this kind of work. Um, sure. Well, in cases like that, I say, hooray, welcome aboard, make your case. And if they present a compelling argument, um, if they make a case and everybody says, yeah, you know, you're right. You're absolutely right. We should make that part of it. Well, then they've strengthened the project. They've gotten everyone else to say, this is a cool element. Um, and, and the whole thing becomes a little stronger, more bulletproof, more interesting, um, because it's been vetted by this super mind of, of people. There are plenty of cases where people show up and say, you know, I really think your uh, seafaring book should be all about underwater adventures instead, and we should explore ocean trenches. And you know, everyone may say, no, that we're not interested in that. that we want to do ships and other things. But um, now, could you maybe add that as an aspect? Let's say you've got an idea for like the you know <coughs> a secret pirate world, and somebody's really interested in underwater. Might he go and uh, you know if he just okay, well, let's make this like a part of the event, so you know. Oh, totally. Uh, I, those sorts of things often happen where it's like, well, you're really into this thing over here, and everyone thinks you're going to do fine with it up until this point. We'll give you whatever six pages or some defined section of the project. Uh, if everyone else says, yeah, that still connects to our main theme, you know, it's Davy Jones's locker that we're exploring in the deep undersea. Okay, well, yeah, pirates want to know about that, and tell me about the cult of Davy Jones, and tell me about the tentacled horrors from the deep, and, and this does apply, um, then yes. But there are plenty of ideas that get floated and go nowhere, right? Uh, it's not like anything you propose will fly. Um, but the ones that everyone buys into, it's wonderful to see this, this huge groundswell of support, everybody throwing out ideas, they feed on each other, it gets more and more interesting, um, so that by the time comes to actually commit words to paper uh, and design the thing, everybody's really charged up about it. Um, and the ideas that kind of flop yeah, everyone's forgotten them by then because they're they're looking at the bright, shiny ideas that succeeded. Um, but yeah, you got to be willing to let stuff go too. So in the chat, David's asking, do you tend to get a larger page count with Patreoners products than you would with other products? Then, yeah, it's true. We do, and there's a project currently that not only has a larger page count than anticipated, it's also split among like four separate books, which just makes it way more complicated. I think that was a mistake. Uh, but, you know, we're not perfect. We, <laughs> we make mistakes. Like, why, we, why did we split this into four books? That was a dumb idea. Um, but yes, because people get excited about these things and because you know, we often underestimate what it's going to take to tackle some of these big topics. Um, the page counts have been creeping upward over time. The first one was like, I don't know, 60 pages. Uh, the most recent patronage project we shipped was the Midgard setting, 296 pages in full color. Um, yeah. So that's at the upper bound of what's possible. The, did you say 290 or? 296 pages, yeah. For Midgard setting? Uh-huh. Why is that the upper bound? I mean, it's not very large. I mean, 
It doesn't seem very large, but here's the reason I think it's the upper bound. Collaboration takes longer than regular design, right? A single writer who makes all the decisions and just hits the keys is going to go faster than a group of people who are discussing where to go next and how to structure it and playtesting every piece. Um, what happens then in the larger and larger patronage projects is the attention span of the audience eventually fades, right? There's always a burst of enthusiasm that lasts for a few months when everyone's hammering on the cool stuff. Then there's play test and that gets everyone excited again. And then there's a long period of it needs to be edited, art generated, layout, printing. Um, if you're, there's no way to crowdsource the editing and there's no way to crowdsource all of the layout and still have it feel like a single piece. So what happens is you, you wind up with like a year of editing and layout and printing on a book, right? If it's huge. Um, I think basically patronage books can't get more than, I don't know what the upper bound is, honestly, but we've definitely hit it because, you know, six months, 12 months into a project, a lot of the original enthusiasm is gone and your hardcore still working on it and your lead designer definitely still pushing um, but you yeah return? You, you run out of steam yeah. now can you return to a project like you release the Midgard can you uh, maybe return to uh, Midgard with a new supplement maybe the Vanaheim supplement or the you know Southland supplement or something sure like yeah no the Southlands book is something we keep talking about um, we did done a number of supplements for Midgard before the campaign setting actually hit um, and we'll do more after. We've got a bunch of adventures coming that are not patronage projects. They're just written independently, short adventures. Um, and those things, yeah, you can return to the same setting over and over. Uh, when we started, we didn't have any sense that, hey, we're going to be building a setting. Um, but all of the patronage projects, including the Arabian Nights one and others, um, they all built on the same premise, and, and people wanted them to connect, so we connected them. Uh, quick question, what, what game system is Midgard for? Midgard has been run on four systems and still supports three of them. It started as 3.5 D&D, uh, it moved to Pathfinder, it moved to 4th edition, and it also supports Dragon Age. So there's a bestiary for Pathfinder, D&D 4th, and Dragon Age. Now, do you um, find it, it mutates the setting when you change the game system? Because I found that when I try to convert it to the game system, I end up mutating the concepts, like taking Iron Kingdoms to RuneQuest. Now, all of a sudden, a lot of things turn out differently. You get a lot of things that you did not get in the original, you know, third edition D and D Iron Kingdoms. And you, you yeah, find that happening think, when you do that? Yeah, things happen to some degree with that. I mean, the primary setting, or the primary rule set has been Pathfinder for a while now, just because that's what the, the patrons have asked for. Yeah, Pathfinder and D&D &D are not very different, but when you turn to Dragon Age, you see major, uh, I, like, maybe not major changes, but a lot of things that, boy, this is really different. Like, when I did Iron King's Rune Quest, I was like, well, gee, all your... You know, spellcasters are now, they're all the same. It's just which which runes they have. Or you find out every yeah. religion has to have a druid, basically a, a forest cult because they all have to, you know, even the one that's not the god of the wilderness, he still has to have the guys out there in the forest doing things or protecting the people. The sure, so well, I think that you, you do get changes in the way the game is run um, and the rules supporting it do matter. Uh, Dragon Age is less high magic, but it actually fits the Midgard tone fairly well. Um, and we've had no trouble making those adaptions. But we, had to rewrite, we had to write new spell schools for Dragon Age that we, you know, that were trivial in D and D or Pathfinder, but required a lot of extra effort to uh, to design and balance correctly for Dragon Age. So. Yeah, but if someone's interested enough to do the work um, and play test it, then by and large, you know, we've we've done it. Um, but we do have preferred systems that are better supported than others. It's just Dragon Age doesn't get a lot of support, period. So the fact that we're doing anything for it uh, means people show up and and have fun with it.
Do, do you find that works better? You take something that's not really well supported at the time, like Dragon I Age. Think- you, you have your Patronage niche? is perfect for non-well-supported role systems, right? Um, people who are, who are dying for content, you know, um, are more likely to show up and get involved because they realize that's the only way they're going to get the next A supplement or A new adventure is if they chip in and do some of it themselves. So I've seen groups that are for games, I don't know, that are perfectly good games, but without a lot of public official publisher support um, they've gotten permission um, or they've they've gone off and and tried it but just getting a successful patronage project to go is uh, is a learned skill right I mean I've been doing it for six years now and I'm still learning in the chat David's asking what uh, patronage products you're planning or thinking about in the future Hmm. Well, uh, the one that's currently being planned and and cooking is called Midgard Tales, and it's a collection of about 13, 14 adventures in the Midgard setting for Pathfinder. Um, We're going to have... um, We're going to have probably... I think I'm going to get about a dozen pitches for next year's project. Um, I've asked some of the most uh, active participants in the current project to pitch me something for next year. And I expect to get about a dozen suggestions for the next project. And those will be in my inbox in a couple of weeks. And I will stew on them and we'll make some kind of decision about going forward with one or None of them if I don't think they're going to work. I don't know. We'll, we'll see what comes in. Usually there's at least two or three awesome ideas. And that'll be the next project, but I don't know what it is just yet. Could be generic. Need not necessarily be Midgard. And uh, David saying that he thinks the world could use a good science fiction or superheroes or modern spy story arc and wants to know if you have plans in that direction. I think I find there's a ton of fantasy out there already. When we look at the books like geez, another, another fantasy book, the way you know, you know, whereas versus science fiction and superheroes and modern spies are not anywhere near as well supported. Right, I'd agree. I, I think something like Spycraft or um, I don't know, name your favorite science fiction game right now, um, Eclipse Phase. Well, that's better supported the most. Anyway, uh, yes, I think those genres all suit themselves to this. Um, I don't have any plans in those directions, which doesn't mean it won't happen. Um, the only things we've done that reach out that way a little bit are we did pure horror uh, in our Call of Cthulhu project, um, but I think Cthulhu is actually pretty well supported. The, the weird thing about patronage is you do get these small communities that are enthusiastic and push, um, but there is a minimum size somewhere, right, where it's like, we can't raise enough money to pay the artist, pay the editor, pay the printer uh, to make it happen. I don't know what that minimum size is, but, you know, you could experiment on Kickstarter and find out. Um, yeah, does this mean that, that science fiction and, and modern spice don't have the uh, people don't, don't buy them or I don't know. Uh, I think people do buy them. I think they just fantasy is a bigger market. It's, it's like I always buy fantasy because that's the only thing out there. Maybe it's because the stores are not don't have them or something, or maybe they haven't been marketed as it shouldn't. Because one thing I think you get you know, a lot of people would prefer one versus the other. You know, a lot of people don't like science fiction, a lot of people don't like fantasy. Uh, I, sure, like, but, I like to have a variety, and so you know, if I'm looking at a book, I see a science fiction book on one side and a fantasy book on the other side. I'll probably get the science fiction because I, I have less of that, and uh, it's not a spy, so that makes something for those. Right. Huh. Well, I don't think I have a solution for you. Right. The the answer is write my own book or something. <laughs> yeah, you got to run your own project, or you got to go to, uh, you know, a publisher of your favorite superheroes game and talk to the mutants and masterminds folks and and say, hey, I want to do this project. Would you give me permission to, 
you know, slap the Mutants and Masterminds logo on it and, uh, you know, see how it goes. Uh, they certainly have an audience. They've been around 10 years. It's an awesome rule set for supers. Uh, or you could approach Margaret Weiss and talk about Marvel, but I think you run into a whole other set of issues there. Um, yeah. Each of these things has its own fan base, and as long as you know where to find those people and they say, yeah, it's a great idea, um, like any crowdsourced kind of project, it it can happen. I, I don't see any reason why this model wouldn't work for those genres. So what, what sort of what sort of ideas do you tend to look at then when you are thinking about what, what to do? What 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 are you, what, what's your thinking when you decide what to do next? Ah, okay. Well, um, at the moment, I am uh, really burnt out on giant three hundred page, two hundred and fifty page books. I want to do a shorter project with less people. So <laughs> uh, uh, maybe this is called taking a breather for three months or something. But doing a small project and doing it really well is appealing to me right now because coordinating the work on these can be uh, uh, it's it's a lot of work in itself. Um, so I mean that's from a personal direction. I think that would be neat. I also think that projects with a lot of opportunities for brainstorming and projects with a lot of opportunity for um, patron input tend to generate a, a huge level of enthusiasm. Where patronage projects that are, um, you know, one primary author, you got to be a superstar author to to get that to work, right? I mean. If Monty Cook says, hey, I want to write this project, great. Uh, if Greg Stolze says, hey, I got this little thing I want to do, awesome. Um, if someone new shows up and says, I've never published anything, but I have this project to do, well, it's harder. Um, so either you've got to have a cool creator at the heart of your project, or you've got to have a really cool idea. And, and I don't know, a Galactic Federation sounds like a pretty cool idea to me. You could parcel out star systems to different patrons and say, you know, you've got 2,000 words for your system, go. Um, and probably come up with some great stuff. Wow, somebody's not happy back there. <laughs> uh, my son is playing Minecraft. I think he's excited rather than anguished. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> Well, good. As long as he's gaming and having a good time, are we? Uh, I think we're just about out of time. Um, it yeah. does look that way. Um, currently, is there any final questions for uh, Wolfgang? David has a question in the chat about whether you've done any science fiction projects and if they encountered any special issues. Alas, I have not. Well, I have done science fiction projects on my own. I wrote one for TSR, and I wrote a sort of conspiracy near future science fiction title for wizards uh, neither one of those was a patronage project so uh, and I think we know the somewhat unfortunate history of science fiction RPGs which is everybody tries them and none of them have been huge breakout hits since like Traveler was good. That, Traveler. That, seems be, that seems to be the exception that proves the rule. I think is Traveler. Um, yes. And of course, the ones that are based on a, a setting like Star Wars and you know, like Star Wars and Star Trek, I'd say were, were also successes. Maybe oh, absolutely. As well. But right. The original one was probably Traveler. Was the only original one. I think Traveler probably is the best one too. Yeah. No. Definitely. I I'm sure there are special issues that you run into with science fiction games that you wouldn't with fantasy or supers. Um, I haven't given it enough thought to really know what the roadblocks would be, but I suspect one of your first roadblocks from the way I usually run these things is, so is there a, an open rule set that you could use as a platform to build on, or would you be building a new rule set from scratch? That's the first obstacle I'd say. Of course, now there are lots of options. D20 Future, um, BRP, Basic Role Playing, uh, Savage Worlds. But, See, yeah. you already know where to go with this. You should be running this project. <laughs> maybe I should. Maybe I should, maybe I should turn my third Legion idea into a really crowdsourced project. <laughs> I, I have no track record, though. I've got absolutely no track record. I'm a software engineer. I have no, no track record in writing this uh, science, you know, Publishing, getting anything published in the uh, RPG industry. It is a it is a whole new skill set and a whole different field. But 
And it'd probably be hard to make the, the money I'm making as a software engineer. It'd be hard to make the money as an RPG designer. It'd be really uh, I'm, I'm very confident that you would not make that level of money as an RPG designer. It's, uh, it's way more a hobby field, and software development is more lucrative. On the other hand, you can run these sorts of things over longer stretches of time or on a smaller budget with you know smaller goals uh, and still have a really great time. So. Well, maybe I'll come up with something in the future, then you never know. <laughs> give, it, give it some thought. Maybe the model will work. Um, if you do, uh, shoot me an email about it. I will tell some of my past and present patrons that, hey, somebody's doing a science fiction project. You should go check it out. Sounds good. Well, thank All you right. very much, there. <laughs> All right. And uh, unless there's any final questions, it does look like we have ran out of time. All right. Well, great talking to everybody. Thanks for moderating. My pleasure. Good talking with yeah. you. Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. See you at the rest of the con. Indeed. Thank you, Wolfgang. Hoping you have a great rest of the day. Thank you. And thank you, Tavis, for moderating. Um, currently, uh, we were scheduled to have a panel with uh, James Carpio of uh, the Chapter 13 Press. However, he did have to... Uh, opt out due to emergency reasons, so I'm hoping things are going well for him. Um, we are taking a hour break right now from our panels uh, during this downtime. At uh, 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, um, I will be moderating the Design Mechanism Question and Answer panel um, with Lawrence Whitaker and Pete Nash. Um, we will be seeing you then. Thank you. Okay, thank you.